looks at what the effect of polarization is on lawmaking, on policymaking, the policy impact of polarization. If there's anything most people know about how Congress has changed, it's that it's a lot more partisan than it used to be. This figure displays a measure of partisan voting, the percentage of votes that divide 90% of Republicans from 90% of Democrats. It used to be quite rare for roll call votes to break down in such a starkly partisan manner. But in recent Congresses, more than half of House roll call votes break down in this manner, as do 30 to 40% of Senate roll call votes. It's almost a parliamentary level of partisanship. Another angle on these changes is to look at party cohesion in Congress on time, over time. This figure displays average Senate Republican and Democratic Party loyalty between 1956 and 2018. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the typical senator voted with his party on controversial issues just over 60% of the time. In the 1980s, just over 70% of the time. In the 1990s, just over 80% of the time. And since 2000, senators have voted with their parties on average above 89% of the time. The story is the same in the House. The question is whether this increased party cohesion makes the majority party more self-sufficient in lawmaking. This figure dis uh, displays the House majority, uh, the co cohesion of the House majority party over time. So it's the same data I just displayed, but now shown in bar graph. But you can't just compare levels of cohesion over time because whether a party is able to execute on its agenda without any cross-party support also depends on the size of its majority. So, and majority parties' margins of control in, uh, in the Congress since, the, uh, since 1994 have been quite narrow. A majority party with only a narrow margin of control has to marshal very high levels of party cohesion in order to legislate without any cross-party support. So what you what's displayed here is the threshold that they would need based on the size of their majority, the threshold of cohesion that would be necessary if the party is going to legislate without any cross-party support. The, um, so what you can see here, looking at this graph, is first of all, for most of the time series, cohesion in Congress is not quite high enough to reach that threshold level of what would be necessary to legislate without any cross-party support. The huge Democratic majorities in the 1960s and 1970s rarely reached the level. On, uh, but what you began to see is in the, in the 1980s, Democrats first began to produce the kind of levels of cohesion that would be necessary to legislate without any cross-party support. Then they lost the majority. Uh, the Republican majorities of the, of the uh, Clinton and Bush years were so narrow that even though they were highly cohesive, they were not cohesive enough to legislate without any cross-party support. What we're seeing now in the most recent, recent Congresses is levels of cohesion uh, that in conjunction with the size of the majority are high enough for majority parties to legislate without any cross-party support. So this is for the House of Representatives. I also have the data here for the Senate. Now the Senate is not a majority rule institution, so in many cases, even if you have a majority, it's not enough to, 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 to legislate. But for those matters, like budgets, where a simple majority is sufficient in the Senate, then um, what you see is that in recent years, cohesion has been high enough for majority parties to legislate without cross-party support. Really unusual for the time series. Look how far away from uh, sufficient levels of cohesion the, the uh, Congresses of the 20th century were. Concurrent with this dramatic increase in partisanship, members have instituted more centralized, leadership-driven legislative processes that are thought to facilitate partisan lawmaking. Party leaders take a much more assertive role in managing floor debate in both chambers. In the House, this takes the form of restrictive rules that limit or prohibit members from offering amendments to legislation on the floor. Almost all rules today are restrictive and uh, almost half are closed to all amendments. So just take it or leave it. No amendments permitted. In the 
leaders make much heavier use of their procedural prerogatives to limit an uh, offering of amendments. And as you can see here, amending activity on the Senate floor has been curbed. More policy development is now centralized in party leadership offices. You can see this from the percentage of uh, bills that, that Congress but did not go through a committee process. You, so the, this is the depar so-called departure from regular order. That used to be that nearly all bills were reported that passed were reported from a committee or had been had seen a committee process. But now just over half of bills go th that pass go through a regular committee process. So given these changes, increased party cohesion and centralization of power in Congress over bill development and then over floor management, majority parties should have strengthened their capacity to enact their policy agendas. But have they? A lot of scholarship suggests that the answer to that question is yes, that there's a, a well-known theory in uh, uh, the study of congressional politics called conditional party government. And the argument there is that as parties uh, become more cohesive and polarized from one another, leaders will empower their, or members will empower their leaders to, um, uh, uh, to uh, you know, give them more procedural authority to push through the party's agenda. There are uh, 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 other theories uh, with you know, scholarly, scholarly jargon that we are somewhat known for of uh, procedural cartel theory also argues that strength that more intent, that stronger partisanship more polarized parties will lead to stronger leaders more able to carry out their agenda